Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Class Arachnidia, Part 2, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Melissa Silva. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Melissa. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, second part of the arachnid. So to start, well, just a, a brief uh, introduction uh, of myself. I'm a marine biologist. Uh, nowadays, I'm working with uh, Natural Habitat Adventures, guiding these amazing trips to the monarch butterfly sanctuaries. And um, well, uh, I decided to give you this information about the class arachnida because sometimes we tend to like better other uh, animals uh, rather than these uh, critters that are not sometimes not so good looking. So um, butterflies are, are some of the of the, the favorite for for the people. But I think if you get to know others, you might like others too. And uh, or at least understand why they are important. So uh, just a brief uh, reminder of what we saw on the pre on the previous webinar. Uh, both insects and arachnids belong to the phylum Arthropoda. They are uh, there are many other arthropods like crustaceans, for example, crabs uh, or um, shrimps, and uh, well, they have these um, similarities: uh, exoskeleton, jointed appendages a segmented body, a bilateral symmetry. And uh, to sometimes we make the mistake of uh, saying that spiders, for example, that are the most known um, uh, arachnids, or uh, scorpions, that they are insects and they are not. Uh, here we can have a, have a comparison between an insect, uh, a bee, and a tarantula. So uh, basically, um, to make a, a differentiation, Spiders have, or, or arachnids in general, have two segments in their body. Meanwhile, uh, insects have three. Um, arachnids have eight legs. Insects have six. And the insects only um, in, in this group, they have antenna. They, most of them have wings. And they have compound eyes. So the arachnids, in general terms, have a simple eyes, two, um, one pair or more. Uh, then um, another characteristic that the uh, arachnid have is that they belong to the Sufilum chelicerata, and that means that instead of man uh, jaws or, or mandibles like uh, the insects, that is in the group uh, mandibulata, they have this chelicerate. And uh, in some spiders, this is adapted as a fang, for example, but in some other groups, those are uh, pincers, for example. And they also have another pair of appendages named peripalps that have uh, different functions, can be used as an aid on reproductive este, processes or um, as a sensorial appendages or uh, as grabbing some like, like, like pincers as well. So I won't go any deeper on this, uh, this slide because we already saw that on the previous webinar. But um, in general terms, these are the characteristics that we can find in all of the arthropods, on all of the um, arachnids. And uh, on my previous webinar, I mentioned uh, seven of the 11 ex uh, extant ordered orders of arachnids. Uh, uh, I, I made this uh, joke of um, the arachnids are basically like Barbie. They can be anything they want to be because we, we have groups that are diurnal and others that are nocturnal. We have groups that are within the same uh, class that are free living. For example, some acari, some uh, mites are free living, but also some other mites are parasites and the same with ticks. Some are free living, some are parasites. They can be predators, herbivores, omnivores, ne necrophage. Um, so basically they can eat anything depending on the group they are. And we can find them on ground or under the ground uh, being um, uh, cryptics, or some of them can be aquatic. So we basically find them anywhere uh, uh, when we speak about the class Arachnida. 
So in this webinar specifically, I will mention these four uh, orders, so Piliones, Solifuge, Amblipigi, and Ricinule, plus uh, four extant, uh, extinct orders that we only find in fossil records. So to start with the with the uh, living, one of the living orders of arachnids is the Ricinule, or uh, also named hooded tick spiders. Um, nowadays, uh, there are known 11, uh, 101 species. Back on the day, uh, there were thought to be only fossils, but uh, in, in early 900s, they discovered the living ones. Um, they are very tiny, you can see, less than, than half of an inch of size. And most of them are nocturnal. Some others are a, something that is called a troglobiot, tro, troglobiots, um, that they live in caves only, that they are adapted to live in caves. And usually they are associated to a high humidity uh, environments. So they, they can be um, under the bark of some trees in, in humid environments or associated to water within the, the caves. Um, so the general uh, body disposition, they have these two segments in their body, the opistosoma and, and the prosoma. Um, the second uh, uh, pair of legs, usually is the sensorial legs. And something very important to mention about this is um, they don't have eyes. They are basically blind. In some species, they have areas that are light sensitive. So they can um, perceive some changes in light, but in, in general, they don't have a sight. Uh, so this, the second pair of legs are the, the sensorial legs. And in some species, the male has this first uh, section of the second pair of legs modified for uh, some reproductive uh, uh, or, or, or mating um, reason. Uh, usually what we think, what researchers think about this is that it's for competition uh, between males for the females, but it's not fully um, proven. And then what they do have, all males on, on this uh, 101 species of Ricinule, is um, the, that the last segment of the third uh, pair of legs is adapted for copulatory purposes. So uh, as I mentioned in the previous webinar, most of the arachnids, all of the arachnids made with the uh, use of a spermatophore, a sac with the sperm, uh, some of them deposit uh, in the ground and then the female grabs it and puts it in, in, in so into the, her body. But in this case, for example, with the resinulase, the male takes the spermatophore and places it into the female with the use of this uh, uh, third appendage uh, that is modified for that reason. But well, uh, the name hooded tick spider comes from this unique plate that they have on the head that is called cuculus, that uh, in Latin means hood. So this um, plate covers, is found in, in both uh, sexes and covers the chelicera and uh, the, the pedipalp area where the pedipalps are inserting. So uh, these are some amazing uh, micrographies of, microphotographies of the cuculus you can see in the bottom images where, where I'm pointing out um, the chelicera right there. And then I have another here. So this is the lateral view. You can see the cuculus here, the chelicera being basically protected by the cuculus, then the mouth and other parts. And here's another micrography with showing the pedipalps, the little tiny pedipalps nearby the um, mouth by the cuculus area, and then how it is displayed. So there's a, a, a lot of information about this. Um, if you want to, to learn more about specifically where I took these diagrams from, go to, to this article here from uh, um, 2011, uh, Talarico et al. Um, so well, basically, what they what they can do with the cuculus is to protect their chelicera, and they move them um, at their will 
to release the chelicera and grab because um, their food because they are predators actually despite they, they don't have any legs, it's the eyes, with their sensorial legs, they can catch their prey. And something very, very cool to tell about this group, the Ricinulae, the hooded tick spiders, is that there are only three uh, families within this order, and they are only located in this um, tropical area on the, on the uh, uh, on the north of the equator, if you if you check, uh, so nowadays they are using the distribution and the adaptations how they evolve uh, from one to another to see um, how the tectonic plates were moving. So uh, if you notice, uh, they are basically on the areas where this theory, the tectonic plate theory, tell us that Amer the Americas and um, Africa was uh, in one continent when they were all together. So it's, it's something also very interesting if you want to go and check on this other uh, article. And something that I wanted to uh, brag a little bit, show off, is that um, Mexico has the, the highest uh, diversity of species in terms of resinulates with 21 species. And one of the, the newest discovered and described was in Chiapas, in the forest of Chiapas, in the south of Mexico. So you can also go and check this article that is very, very interesting and important, of course, for science. So the Amblypigids, uh, it's another order that we still have nowadays uh, within the class Aragnida. And despite the looking of this, um, they are actually very, uh, they are some very popular uh, pets, and this is a. They are actors also. They they are performers. So we have seen that in in um, Harry Potter's um, okay, the Goblet of Fire. So you, if if you like Harry Potter, you will remember this uh, this group of organisms. So we find them in humid areas of the tropics and subtropics. Mm, most of them are nocturnal, or uh, if they are um, uh, troglo troglobites, if they live in caves, they can be active during the whole day. But uh, they they are completely harmless. And uh, well, the most the, the characteristic that you can see them at first glance, the most important thing that we can mention is their uh, peripalps. So they do have chelicera, very tiny chelicera, and they have these huge pedipals that are modified to catch their prey. So basically is what um, we can compare this to what the mantis have. Basically the same, the same way the mantis have their first pair of legs is what they have with these pedipals. And in some species, the pedipals open from side to side can be up to 10 inches long and the body can be as big as maybe one and a half inch, two inches top, but the pedipalps can be way bigger than that. And um, they use the first pair of legs as sensorial legs. And I here I have this video that I really liked. It shows us how the uh, fir first pair of legs, the sensorial feels that cricket and the speed to catch that cricket. So uh, they are harmless, completely harmless, harmless to humans, but well, they are deadly to other arthropods, as you can see here. So they are very fast and they are very efficient to uh, when they catch their prey with these uh, pedipalps. So in general terms, the amblypigid are very territorial. They actually fight over their territory with other amblypigids. They are very protective with others. Uh, for example, if you try to, to grab them or go close to them, they will try to scare you away with the pedipalps. But there are some species and in some moments of their lives where they uh, become a little bit more social, specifically when it is um, it, about the mother and the baby. So uh, the, the reproduction is very similar to other 
uh, arachnids, they have some kind of like mating dance and then the male uh, puts uh, the spermatophore on the ground, attaches it to the ground and then the female goes on top of that and fertilizes the egg. Uh, but then the female, instead of carrying an egg sac or, or, or laying the eggs on the environment, she carries the egg sac within the body in a, in a skin-like sac under the abdomen. And when the babies hatch, they go immediately up on top of the mother, very similar to what uh, the um, scorpions do and very similar to what other arachnids do. And this is vital because if they fell down or if they are separated from the mother when they hatch, they basically die because they are very fragile and they need the, the protection the mother can give and uh, a little bit of the, of the food that, they, that she can catch for them, like the leftovers that she can give. Uh, once they mold, uh, you can see on this picture on the right, on top right, once they mold, uh, they can go off the mother, but close to her. So they are very social in that uh, moment. As you can see here, they are communicating to each other with the, with the first uh, pair of legs, the sensorial legs. And uh, well, eventually, uh, as, as they grow up, uh, they will go away from the mother. So there's another article here that I'm sharing that you can go on and read more of the scientific side of what I just said. So from the solifuge uh, order or the, the, the camel spiders or sun spiders, um, this group has more than 1,000 species and it's a, a huge variety. You can see these comparative images here and on the left of the slide, sizes, colors, shapes. In general, they have the same distribution of, of the body, but uh, with different lengths or, or weights. Um, we can find them in uh, arid environments, in shrublands, or some of them can be found in forests, but associated to more like arid or, or dry environments, except the um, Australia and Madagascar. We cannot find sol, uh, solpugids or solifuge in these areas. Um, the first pair of legs uh, is used as the sensorial leg, the pedipalp is also used as a, as a sensorial, as a, a, a mechanoreceptor. And they have some specific organs that are uh, only present in this, in this order that, is called, that are called the malioli or maliolus. Um, bracket organs is, is called as well. They are kind of like fan shape or mushroom shape uh, chemoreceptors. And in association with the pedipalps and the malioli, they can actually feel or detect preys that are burrowed uh, shallowly underground. So with that, they, they can be very successful in finding food. And uh, the, the characteristic that, it, that we can identify them the most or, or easiest is the chelicera. So they have this huge chelicera that can be up to one third of the body length in some species. And they have this uh, scissor-like movement when they are uh, using them. Uh, but they are completely harmless to uh, humans. They are uh, very good predators. They can catch any arthropod. They can basically feed also on some small birds or small lizards as this one on the image on the, on the top, it's the bottom right. But you can have them, you can hold them, and they, if anything, if they bite you, it's going to be painful, but you won't die. Um, so the opiliones, the order opiliones, uh, well-known uh, daddy long legs or harvestmen, uh, sometimes mistaken with some other true spiders that have also very long uh, legs. Uh, but well, these are very different in because their body, despite the, there are two divisions of the body, has this broad uh, union that we perceive as one single uh, body piece, but uh, it, it still has two divisions. And uh, they are, the body itself is very tiny, one inch the top, but the legs, one single leg can be up to 
almost six inches. But that's not the, that's like the most uh, known uh, the shape of the opiliones, but there's, that's not the, on, the only one. We have other opiliones that are like this one on the, on the left corner, uh, bottom corner of, of the slide, that it's uh, basically, for me, it looks more like a, like a mite rather than an opilion. And uh, this one on, on the bottom uh, corner has these huge appendages here that are the chelicera, that are modified, huge modified chelicera. So, of course, there's a, a variety and diversity of, of shapes and, and, um, and sizes. All of them adapted, of course, for their uh, mostly their feeding purposes. So they are generalistic. We, we call those, they can feed basically on anything. Scavengers, they can be carnivorous. They can be opportunistic, feeding on the leftovers of uh, other uh, predators. And they, some of them can actually eat pollen or even fungi, like this one that I'm showing on the, on the right uh, bottom image. No, uh, not a single species of opiliones has venom or uh, silk glands. So they don't produce uh, the, the silk web, that they cannot have a web, and they are not uh, dangerous at all for humans uh, and, or for other uh, animals. So there are some, some rumors uh, or some beliefs that these are like the most venomous uh, arachnid, but they have so little fangs, they don't even have fangs. So you can see the chelicera here, how it is adapted as a pincer as well. Um, the tiny chelicera there with the pedipop. So they they won't bite us. And even if, if they do, we are not in danger. So sometimes we see the, the harvestmen in these uh, clusters, in these clumps like that. Uh, they can be small, they can be huge. So what they do is that um, they, what we know, for example, from fish, numbers are a protection means protection. So when they go together like this, it's either because they are get, is they seeking protection from predators or because they are in their mating season or uh, they are just uh, getting protection from weather conditions, from wind, from uh, rain. And uh, usually what they what the opilions, opilions do have is um, uh, an odor gland. So they can produce some stinky odors for protection purposes. So sometimes when they are found in these clumps, they can be smelly. They can, be, they can have a bad smell or a stinky smell. And if you disturb them, that I highly don't recommend that, we should not disturb any, any of these animals in the wild. Uh, they will expel some odors for protection. And I say we should not disturb any animal because, well, they are doing their business, not because they are dangerous, but because they are minding their business. So it's like a, if you are taking a nap and someone goes and poke on you, it's disrespectful. So, well, those were the, the last orders of Aragnida uh, that, that are uh, leading to, to our days. And now I will speak about uh, four orders of the Aragnida that are extant already, but well, that are part of this uh, group. So just for you to know where we are uh, standing now, we are here on the Quaternary where with the early apes, the Cenozoic area, and we are going back in time, passing the dinosaurs, passing the first, the, the giant insects from the Carboniferous, up to the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian areas, where we can find these four orders. So I will go from, from the oldest, the Trigonotarvidas, um, to the newest, that the Aptop, Aptopodas. So this uh, order, Trigonotarvida order, is basically mm, in a shape, you can see it's very similar to what we have now as the resinulates or the Acari, the mites and the ticks. But uh, we haven't had any any clue or any key that really tell us who they are related to uh, a little bit more. So they are still in in their order. Um, their pedipalps uh, are are thought to be uh, for, for walking purposes rather for sensorial, 
and the chelicera were very tiny uh, under a hood, under a um, skewed in a triangular triangular shape that resembles the cuculus from the from the ricino lake. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, well, it is thought because of the size of the chelicera that they were scavengers. <coughs> and this is an artistic representation of what they might look on their natural environment back then on the on the Paleozoic area. Mm. The other, this other order, a little bit closer to to uh, our era, is the Phalangiotarbida, and um, their legs, as you can see here on on, on red coloration, <laughs> are very crab-like legs. So they are thought to be walking legs uh, on land. But then they have very tiny pedipods, and they either, they have either um, even tinier chelicera. Mm -hmm minuscular chelicera. So it is thought as well that this group of, uh, of arachnids uh, were scavengers or um, opportunistic predators that uh, if they saw a dead, uh, dead animal or a sick animal that was uh, slow with the slower movements, they will catch them because of this uh, very tiny chelicera. Another artistic representation of what they might have looked like based on the fossils. And then we uh, have this a little bit more similar shape um, order, the Uraraneida. And uh, it is thought that this is um, this or another group that is very similar to that, the, the um, Archaea arachnida, uh, that they were the ancestors of the true spiders or the, the spiders that gave uh, uh, to the family of tarantulas because the fangs the chelicera were very similar so there are only two species of that but they have of this uh, order of the oraneida but they do have the chelicera in a very uh, known shape just like like the fangs of these uh, nowadays tarantulas their legs they are thought to be ambulatory they walk with them and the pedipals because of the position and the shape they are thought to be for a uh, sensorial use. And it is thought that they have, they should have had a uh, seal glands, but it's still not very well uh, known or proven. But uh, as I mentioned, this is like a, the origin of the true spider. So it is thought by, by the researchers that they do have, they did have um, some kind of like, silk glands or something very primitive to build their um, their dens or to to catch their their prey and later uh, eat them. And then the the closest uh, extinct group is the Haptopoda, and they have only found one species of this uh, order with uh, two uh, specimens, uh, actually a male and a female, luckily for for researchers. Um, so these as well, uh, they have a very basic uh, or, or common um, distri body distribution related to the to the arachnida, and uh, they what they saw is that they are very similar as well to the ricinulae because of this shape on the on the opistosoma on the second section of the of the body the tail or the abdomen uh but well since they don't have any other fossil of this group it's very difficult to tell who they are related a little bit more in the within the class arachnida um the legs are for walking purposes as you can see the peripalps is uh, they are thought to be for sensorial purposes and once again chelicera are very small so it is thought that they were also uh, scavengers or uh, opportunistic predators. Another uh, artistic representation of the group, of the species, as I mentioned, only one species of this. So uh, something that I 
with, with this um, uh, order, with the haptopoda order, we finish with the class Arachnida with all the living and extinct orders. And here what I wanted to show and, and to share with you is that um, there is a, a very recent discovery with an, an scorpion, an arachnid scorpion, that give us clue to how the transition from aquatic animals to land animals occur. So we all know that there was uh, like a like an explosion of life during the Carboniferous, the Ordovician, but there is thought also that there was an explosion on land during the Cambrian times, right here where, where we still had the trilobites uh, in the water. And uh, well, during the Silurian, Silurian and Devonian is where we find the fossils, if you remember where we see the these extant or extinct orders of arachnids. But uh, it is thought that before that is when we saw the first uh, movement from uh, water to land. Um, the oldest fossil within the arachnids uh, of, an, of a, a member of this group on land is a scorpion from the Silurian, Silurian right here, and uh, is not a sea scorpion. I will go a little bit deeper on that. Sea scorpions and uh, arachnid, uh, arachnid scorpions are not the same thing. But well, so what they found is that this scorpion, you can see is the, the artistic representation is very similar to a land scorpion that we can find in any any place now uh, days in living being. But they have these um, filamentous structures because they are not true gills, but they they play the same fu function as gills. So that gives the idea to researchers that this scorpion was somehow living in the water. So that's why they needed this, uh, this structure to absorb oxygen from the water. But that also this was able to live outside of the water because of the shape of their legs. So basically it was an amphibious scorpion. If, if uh, we take the word amphibious as something or 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 somehow someone that can live both in the water and outside of the water. So well, that's one of the of the fossils that they have uh, found from the Devonian. We can ha have the the first uh, fish fossils in that very same era. And then we have some other discoveries from the mid Silurian, from uh, the the late the demonic Silurian is a little bit before this one that I mentioned before. Um, so what these three articles are the ones that are talking about what I, I will explain in a moment. So if you want to go like to the source of that, I strongly recommend you to check on this. They are uh, very interesting. They have more diagrams to explain what I, I will show now. So what they found from these fossils is that there was an aquatic scorpion, true scorpion, and they have these crab-like legs. That means that they were living in the water, so they don't really, they can go on the, on, on the tiptoes, for example, they can go uh, the whole body weight on those tips. But then we found another um, a fossil that is considered the transitional uh, specimen between the land the, the aquatic environment to the land environment, where uh, we see now like a more modern leg with uh, something that the last segment of the leg modified to be more like a foot or like a like a, a vertical a horizontal surface instead of the vertical leg that we had on the previous uh, aquatic scorpion. And then the, the modern scorpions that live on land only have this, the similarities to this transitional scorpion with a very well-developed, uh, let's say, foot on the last section of the, of the leg. And well, the, the tarsus to be a little bit more developed for the walking purpose for carrying the, the weight of the body. So basically that's uh, how they know now that's one of the first 
land animals came from uh, an scorpion, from, a, from an aquatic scorpion. So basically that's it. Uh, what questions you have about this or, or what can we share a little bit more, Rob? All right, thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So with that, let's get to some of these questions. So let, regarding the extinct uh, orthopods from the Paleozoic era, um, how big or how small were they? So one of these, I think I have them. Mm -hmm. This one here, for example, the, the bar, marks two millimeters, super tiny. So in total, it would be those, what to say, like one centimeter long. Here we have this other um, measure measure bar or, or in contrast with this. So basically they are no bigger than one inch. In, in this, for example, the trigonotarbida. On the other uh, orders that are extinct, pretty much the same, they were very tiny. And uh, some of them were like this, for example, the Urana, Uran, Uraraneida. They are a little bit bigger, let's say two to three inches top with the flagellum uh, on it. So the flagellum could be two, uh, two centimeters, one inch, and the rest of the body could be one to two inches top. So they are basically very similar to the modern um, acari, if you can relate to that, the mites or the ticks. And these other ones, uh, well, they, they, they were but they are more similar in size and shape to the modern uh, true spiders. So basically pretty small in general terms. Great, thank you. Now, are scorpions and ticks considered to be spiders or arachnids? Arachnids. Mm -hmm. the, so within the class arachnida, the living uh, uh, species that we have or the living groups are the spiders, the ticks, the scorpions. So they are like, uh, I, I can say maybe like cousins in, or, or not brothers per se or sisters, but more like cousins. They are within the same class because their body is divided in the same segments that I, I was mentioning before uh, in here. They have their body divided in two. They have eight pair of legs, the eight legs, four pair of legs. They have the, the chelicera, they have the peripalps, but their body disposition is a little bit different depending on the on the order but they are all arachnids. Scorpions are scorpions, spiders are spiders, and uh, what was mites? Mites and, and those are in the mites, but they are all belonging to the class arachnida. Great, thank you so much. So are arachnids older than insects and did they evolve independently? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, actually um, I think, I hopefully put that one. Let's see, I did it. Okay. So, oh, one second. Uh -huh. Oh, I, so that's something that sometimes we can find to be uh, confusing because we call sea scorpions, but only because of the look they have. So, the sea scorpion belongs to the Eurypterida class and the uh, scorpions belong to the arachnida and these two together to the horseshoe crab and the sea spiders they belong to the Suphylum chelicerata and then insects are on this is a an ant or the silhouette of an ant insects are in another branch of this uh, life tree and they belong to the Sophylum mandibulata. So the, the phylum arthropod, as I mentioned, uh, has the, the crustacean, uh, let's just say crabs, shrimps, they have the insects, we have the, the 
but they are divided depending on um, certain dispositions and they evolve completely separate, a very different uh, factors that um, they had to, to cope with. So yeah, insects are, the only thing they have in common with, with arachnids is that they are in the same phylum, the arthropoda, that means um, legs with segments or jointed appendages. So that's the only like thing in common that they can have, the exoskeleton and others, but they are not any, any more uh, closely related. So are there any ways in general that we can determine if an arachnid has venom or not? E, no, I mean, no, not, not in a, an easy way. Um, because, for example, um, well, we know scorpions have venom, some sp spiders have venom, some have more like potent or, or toxic venom than others. But um, the little tiny um, book scorpions or pseudoscorpions, they have venom in their chelicera as well. But since they are so tiny, they, they never, they won't affect us at all. Uh, but then some opiliones, some uh, um, daddy long, long legs that have this huge uh, pedipox and, and chelicera that are very, very similar to this uh, from the book scorpions that have venom, they don't have, the opilions don't have venom. So it's very difficult to tell, oh, well, because of the size or their color or the shape, we cannot tell that easy. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, I, some people have heard some information about the Lone Star Tick. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, is this a worrisome thing? Should we be worried about this tick? What's the name of that again? It's the Lone Star Tick. Lone Star Tick, Lone Star Tick. Uh, let me check, is that the big red one? I don't know if they can, Lone Star Tick, because I've heard of- yes. It's a red tick. It it's has a red one, uh, right? Long. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me see. see uh, okay. Amblyoma. Okay. Um, so I think for what I can see here is from the family Ixox, Ixodide. Yeah. So for as far as I know, this family Ixoside, Ixodide is the family. I'm, I'm just checking here. On a quick look as the Google search. Um, the ticks from, from that family, they are, they have, they don't have poison, they are not venomous, but some of them have a parasite within that can cause a, a can, can make us sick, humans or animals that are bitten by, by those. So basically what my personal recommendation, I'm not a, a um, specialist on ticks, but uh, I have, have dogs, I've been in, in, the, in ranches and farms and in, on the mountain uh, where you can find a tick and they go on you. Uh, any tick is potentially dangerous or potentially um, can, can, can potentially harmful you, harm you because uh, they can either have a parasite that can make you sick or uh, they can, uh, when you scratch when, when they bite, you can get an infection on that. So you consider, you should consider any tick to be not beneficial for the human. So in general terms, um, ticks are considered to be of economic importance because they affect, for example, uh, the farms, they affect uh, chicken farms, they affect uh, the cow farms. So they are considered to be um, medically and economically important. So you just should keep that in mind that they can be um, well, dangerous, but any species of tick in general terms. Thank you for addressing that, Melissa. We appreciate mm -hmm. that. So where, in it, where have these fossils been found of the extinct arachnids? Oh, most of them, for what I saw, uh, on the 
Burmese amber. I think it's Burmese amber. And some of them, very few in this, uh, in the States, in this huge, I forgot the name of that uh, findings, nearby Utah. But uh, let's say that 80% of the fossils have been found on the Burmese amber. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, one of our guests it, it speculates that, it, well, it seems to them that there is more spider activity this year than usually before the fall. Um, mm -hmm. Is that due to the heavy rain that we had during the winter or can you speculate as to why that would be? Okay, so if if we, Usually, if we take what we know about, like in general terms, about uh, bugs, insects, arachnids, other uh, animals that rely on on the weather, on the temperature of the environment for their living, uh, usually when it's warmer, they get to be more active. Let's say that they they have inner batteries that are charging with the warmth of the exterior, with the with the temperature of the of the environment, so the the warmer the environment is, they will be more active. Um, sometimes also they can have more offspring when there are weather uh, humid conditions. For example, if, if we had very heavy rains or or a longer uh, rainy season. Uh, there will there will be more food sources for uh, the offspring, so they will lay not not they might not lay more eggs, but there will be a higher survival rate because of the food uh, source. Um, so, for what I know, I can uh, speculate on that. Like there is more food source, there is a warmer environment, so there are like perfect conditions for, in general terms, arachnids. Uh, uh, and in, in this case, the, the question was about spiders. So yeah, I mean, they can find more food and better weather for their survival. So maybe that's why we can see more uh, or more active as well. How large can a scorpion get and are they deadly? Well, um, there's one species I think of, I think it's in Africa, I don't remember well, but or here in America, I don't remember. But it's um one foot is almost thirty centimeters, uh a little bit less than one foot <laughs> long. So with the whole um the, the pedipalps extended and the tail extended as well, let's say easily one foot. And um that would be like the biggest uh, scorpion. Uh, and uh, how deadly they are, it depends once again on the species, but it also depends on the person that gets stung. So it depends on the sensibility, how, how sens sensible you are or, or uh, the reaction that your body has to the venom. It's very, pretty much like when you get a stung by a bee, some people can die from a single stung or two, a sting, and uh, some people can get Dozens and it's like well, well I have uh, swallow but I don't die. Um, so yeah, it depends on those basically species of a scorpion. The age of the scorpion usually um, the younger the scorpion, the the more uh, like concent concentrated the venom, like a little bit more potent, so they are able to catch the prey easier. Uh, but well. If, if a human gets uh, stung, can be uh, a little bit more uh, dangerous, and and the the sensi sensitivity that you have to to the venom as a person, as an individual, so that would be the reason. So Melissa, do you have a favorite arachnid? Oh well, now with everything that I saw. Uh, I really loved the Ricinule and well, I think I have like maybe one species of each. Uh, I really love the the mite, the water mite that 
preys on mosquito larva. I, I don't like mites or ticks. So that one would be like my new favorite. Um, the solifuge, the sun spiders, I think they are very beautiful. Uh, they are so ugly that they are beautiful. Um, the from the opiliones, I really like the, the I think it's Tarsus, the gener the the gener genus of that one with the very big pedipalp to open snails. Um, but yeah, the resinule, I think those are like the cutest ones, like with the cuculus, kind of like a like a stuffed animal. That would be my top one. <laughs> That's a good reason, I think. <laughs> Right. That's going to be the last question that we do have time for today, Melissa. So I'd okay. like to hand it back to you for your closing comments. Yeah, I do have a, a closing comment that I want uh, people to take uh, to to take with you, uh, attach like a tick to your skin. Uh, in in uh, science, I had noticed, and now I, I found this article. I can uh, I feel supported by the science community that uh, there is a bias on what we uh, study as uh, scientific and um, a bias of what we like as society. Uh, usually uh, with, with this uh, article, um, they mention that in general, uh, we study more like things that we like, how they look or, or for example, there's a, a very clear example, rodents. If I tell you, uh, let's study the rats from the sewers or the rats from this uh, farm, and we go like, wow, no, we don't like rats because they are filthy, whatever. And if I tell you, let's study the, um, is the, oh, I forgot the name in, in English, ardillas. Um, Oh, I forgot the name of the ardilla in, in English. Well, another rodent that is on the trees with a fluffy uh, tail. Uh, so you have two squirrel. species. That... Which one? The squirrel. Squ the squirrel. Yes, thank you. I don't know what I couldn't think about. So if I tell you to study a rat and to study a squirrel, most of the people prefer the squirrel because they look very beautiful. They are fluffy. and they are basically rodents and they can actually have the same diseases and spread the same diseases to the human. Rabies, for example. So, but because of the look, most of the people prefer the pretty one. So um, my recommendation is that uh, we take this, this bias that we have, that we, we take this uh, idea of uh, some things plants or animals being disgusting or being bad just by the look and give us the opportunity to, to learn about them. That's why I basically decided to do this, these webinars about arachnids to inform uh, about what they do and why they are important. They, they have a vital role in the environment. And nowadays I think it's uh, more important than ever to understand the, the the place of each living being in nature. Melissa, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.